I had um, a weird encounter this week. So what happened is that I, I, I went out to take the trash and then went back home to do some laundry, you know, alpha male stuff. And then I saw that there was no fabric softener, a little bit more alpha male stuff. So I went out and I had to go to the store and get some. And then um, on, my, on my way back from the store, I noticed that the trash was gone. Like, like um, so we have this weird thing in Belgium. This is going to be a long story. We have this weird thing in Belgium where we have to put out the trash only once a week and we have to put it like on a little street. It's kind of how it works. And then someone collects it, I assume, or it just disappears. But so what happened is that um, I come back and my trash is gone. Like literally everybody else's trash is still on the street. It was still there. Only mine was gone. So I was a little bit worried, uh, but on my way into the apartment, I stopped worrying because I kind of realized that I had probably, I don't know, the trash probably took to the European Parliament here in Brussels. And uh, we'll probably see it as a politician in the news one of these days. But also, that totally didn't happen to me. I read it on Reddit and I thought I'd regurgitate that because that's what we do on here. This is a no, a news, <laughs> a nose, a news show, but also a uh, jokes regurgitation show. More specifically, this is episode 89 of Weekly Talks, which covers the trading week of October 23 through October 27. Um, a pretty, pretty ev eventful week, if you will. So I'm uh, I'm joined by two guests. I have Uranium Insider on here. We covered a few of the uh, more topical issues, if we will. We talked about the valuations on the Uranium stocks, because uh, that seemed to be a thing on Twitter this week. People calling them un overvalued, and then they're fighting whether they're under or overvalued, whatever it is. I also got some feedback on the recent nuclear conference from him. He, he went there to the NEI, as well as um, so some other stuff um, about uranium. And then I also had um, Jose Vizquera. He's a, an economist, an engineer, and a geologist. He's also the CEO of O3 Mining, as well as an advertiser on this channel. And he talked to me about the valuations on the gold stocks and uh, the risks for those stocks moving forward as gold did an interesting move this week, but the stocks didn't. So... Maybe they're just too risky. Maybe they should be undervalued. So that's sort of the topics, uh, the questions that we targeted. But it's also probably a long enough episode already without my yapping. So I'm going to cut that and I'm going to start talking about what kind of week it's been. It's um, summed up. It's really been, uh, I guess if I had to sum it up in two words, it was um, it, it was a bad week. If you count the week describing the week. Anyways, I know that maybe not two words. I don't know how to say that in more words, but it was it was a flight to safety week, basically, if you will, once again. So broad market equities, uh, you know, think about the Dow, S&P uh, 500, NASDAQ, uh, they were all down in the red by two, two and a half percent. Well, the dollar index and gold are up and even bonds. C can you believe it? Even bonds were up. I was told they only go down, but they're like, if you look at the TLT, for example, it's basically at an all-time low, and so if, if it well, if it falls another five percent, that is, uh, which it can easily do within a week or so, and uh, they're oversold. So bonds are oversold too. Uh, so they they cannot really keep going down forever, although they would. By the way, if if Twitter gets any more bullish on bonds, they will. They'll do the exact opposite of what people on Twitter say as always. But the point is that the dollar, gold, and bonds were up this week, while equities are down. So risk off, fly to safety, whatever you want to call it. The main driver of all this still seems to be the conflict in um in the Middle East, and I don't I don't necessarily have to uh, too much to say about it. Besides that, the, the fears for it spilling into other countries uh, are on, on the rise, and that's sort of the prevailing topic within this conflict in relation to the um, financial markets, and uh, specifically this week because. Of the U.S. military conducted what they called self-defense strikes on two Syrian facilities, so in, in the country of Syria. But those facilities were controlled by an Iranian religious group of sorts. So it's it's the U.S. striking Syrian facilities that are controlled by the Iranians. So naturally, there was, there was some fear around that. I'm not Peter Zahan, so I cannot make stuff up right now out of nothing. But as far as I understand it, this has little to do with the main conflict between Israel and Palestine. And it's really the effect, again, on the markets that, that interests me here. And But so it's, it's, it seems that any military action in that region sort of gives a, a knee-jerk reaction to the markets. Um, so sending oil a little bit higher, though oil closed down for the week, 3.5%, send it a little bit higher, and then again, fly, fly to safety. Um, and, you know, the main flick, the main conflict is going on for for what a third week now it's still unresolved it's there's no outlook really on it being resolved anytime soon as far as i can see and there's constant threats of escalations so it's it's or spillover into you know uh pulling other countries 
to that conflict as well. So it's to be expected that the market is in 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 fear or even extreme fear, as you're about as I'm about to talk here in a second. Now, U.S. economic data added to the market fears this week, um, uh, with, with with fears for potentially more rate hikes or at least higher for longer. And those three main things worth mentioning here that was obviously the Fed's preferred measurement of inflation, that being the PCE index, and then the initial Q3 GDP reading as well as jobless claims. Jobless claims are on the rise a little bit, not too much this week. And uh, continuing jobless claims are also higher and on the rise. But the two more interesting things, though, would be the GDP and the PCE. The GDP was already expected to be high. It was already expected at 4.7% for Q3, which, of course, is a rather high number. But the real number came in even higher than that at 4.9% growth. This is the fastest growth since well technically since whatever happened in q4 of 2021 but that of course was not indicative so this is the fastest growth in a very long time and uh the interesting part to me here is that this was supposed to be um you know since 20 this was supposed to be a stimulus driven economy according to to talking heads and also people that i've interviewed on here um ever since like q3 of 2022 because I would talk to them about GDP and I would say, hey, you know, you expect the market to crash and burn, but we have GDP on the rise here. People would tell me, don't worry, this is just, you know, this this growth that we're getting, it was above 2% growth. It, it's not going to continue. This is just stimulus money pouring into the economy. That's going to dry up and, you know, we're going to go back down in, in, in a recession. But the GDP has grown above 2% for five straight quarters now. So it, it, is that still the stimulus talking here? Is that, I, I don't know, is that what's driving the economy? Could be. I don't understand it properly enough to judge, but it is something worth noticing that it's does it has it really taken five or is it going to take more than five quarters for the stimulus to 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 be worked through in the economy? I don't know, uh, or is this really deficit spending um, because of wars and whatnot? Again, another possibility could also, of course, be that they they will they're going to revise the number down uh, later on, so it's going to go from four point nine to whatever lower. It's possible. It's not impossible. We've seen that happen before. But still, if you look at the previous growth, which was 2.1%, now going to 4.9%, that's eye-catching growth, especially eye-catching for the Fed. And also, especially considering that most of this GDP increase was caused by consumer spending, about evenly split between people buying goods and people buying services with uh, a little a little bit more bias towards people buying goods, actually, interestingly enough, because it, it was the summer quarter. So I would have expected to see more, more, uh, you know, services to be driving that. But apparently, people are buying a whole lot of goods during the summer too. And then, you know, the, the overall consensus out there seems to be that this four point nine percent growth is a one-off event. And when I say overall consensus, it's like mainstream economists, like CNBC type uh, or, or CNN or whatever type economists, are saying that the consumer that that the consumer spending is is going to dry up. Which again, consumer spending made about seventy percent of this growth. They're saying that that's going to disappear over the coming months, which apparently has gotten mainstream economists worried, which on its own term is sort of tingling my my wannabe contrarian spidey senses, if you will, because uh, things that mainstream economists say don't necessarily often happen. So, And then onto the PCE index. PCE stands for Personal Consumer Expenditures. Now, this is a measurement of inflation that the Fed is said to be following closely. Well, that rose 0.3% um, in September, so more than it did in August, and also still running hot. It's still at, at close to 3%, so that's way higher than the 2% target that the Fed has. So maybe maybe there's, I mean, there, there is progress, but the work is not done. That's what it comes down to. And not unimportantly, though, the personal spending this month also rose 0.7%, for well, not this month, for the month of September, whereas personal income rose only 0.3%. So what's happening here is that spending is rising over two times faster than incomes are, which is, this is really typical data that you would expect to see in a in an inflationary environment where the consumer is basically draining its savings in order to consume today because they expect goods to be more expensive in the future. That's what it comes down to. And why the Fed watches this is uh, the PCE is because they say that it tells them what the consumer is is about to do. They tell them what consumer expectations are. And this time, although somewhat slowing down again, it tells them that the consumer expects more inflation. Otherwise, why ramp up spending, right? And sort of the same story goes for the GDP as far as I understand it. So well, at this stage, you're probably thinking, okay, the Fed hiked rates for you know a hot minute there for a couple, well, over a year, I believe the sharpest rate hiking cycle in history or whatever it might be 
and they didn't crash anything, right? GDP is skyrocketing, unemployment is uh, low, inflation is slowly but surely being defeated, or if you ask Paul Krugman, inflation is not even in the room, never with us. Um, their inflation measurement tool is is still as 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 high as a kite, though. Um, so they're kind of getting their job done, right? There's, um, I mean, they, they, they've made good progress, but they're not done. So they are going to have to hike or at least keep it higher for longer. And if that's where you're, you're thinking that that wouldn't be a horrible assumption. However, a little bit of hope for the end of the Fed hiking uh, season being in, in sight also came out of um, out of Europe this week, out of the European Union, because the European Central Bank decided to pause for the first time in over a year on the rate hikes. So it was basically straight rate hikes for the last 15 months over here, which got us to where we're at today, which is 4% central bank rates. And um, like that, uh, again, I, I know that you never miss an episode on here because this is an extremely important show, of course. So like you would remember from last week, I talked about a Bloomberg poll that it had shown that rates are expected to stay here for about a year or so in the EU. So what that means and why it matters for the Fed is uh, because maybe, just maybe, it means that Powell doesn't have to defend the dollar against the euro as aggressively anymore because potentially we're done hiking here. Sure, we're going to keep maybe higher for longer, but we're done hiking. That's potentially the signal that comes out of the ECB this week. So maybe he can afford to do what 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 youngsters say these days and and um, and and chill. He can afford to 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 relax. He. He do be chill. I, I believe that's how I'm supposed to pronounce it as a as a Gen Z um, uh, participator. But uh, participator, what in the anyways? The, 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 well, this might mean that the Fed's funds rate will stay where it's at today, but it's not going higher. And the Fed Monitor tool on Investing.com also is still saying that that basically nobody's expecting a rate hike next week on November one. But everyone is expecting for the rates to stay here where, where they are at right now for, for the foreseeable future, which also, by the way, might explain the move in the 10-year Treasury yield this week, which was obviously down because bonds are up. And uh, it's also back down under 5%. It's at 4.8%, while the two years still stays above 5%, again, indicating that the bond market expects more inflation and no rate cuts over the short run, but potentially higher rates for longer. And so... All of this economic data, you know, currency war, uh, jobless claims, PC, GDP, whatever, speculations for the world for World War Three already having started, and so on and so forth, that is causing a whole lot of fear in the market, and that I believe explains the market moves of this week. And so, with all that, the CNN fear and greed index is down to twenty four, which indicates extreme fear. It's been in this sort of twenty five to thirty five range for over a month now, and it's uh, under under twenty five again is extreme fear. And all of the indicators used to build up that index, or well, almost all of them, they're pretty much agreeing with with um, with, with the market being fearful. So we, we look at market momentum is completely lost. You look at the put to call ratio out there; it is way below one. And then you look at the VIX index, which is is rather high. It hasn't been that high since uh, the spring of this year, so about six months or so. So everyone out there is bearish. That's basically what this what this tool is telling us. And that's how the market is acting in different segments, uh, including the bond market, too. And so with all that, uh, oh, yeah, and by the way, you know, I, I, I found something on Twitter this week, actually, that that very well sums up my, my sort of feelings towards this market. And you just got to love Twitter. I mean, as a content creator, well, if you're not a content creator, you really should because it's the easiest job. Well, job. It's the easiest job in the world, especially if you're an interview channel. I'm not going to name any names, but s some interview channels that start that are like two letters that start with an R and T. They're um, I'm not naming names here, but this tweet here is from the Kabasi letter. Um, Kabasi, by the way, means fatigue in Greek, so it's kind of a cool, uh, cool trivia fact there for you. But so the Kabasi letter's tweet here sums up the macro situation perfectly, as, as far as I understand it. Uh, and I quote, stocks are falling like a recession is coming. Home prices are rising like there's no recession coming. Bonds are falling like the Fed is going to be raising rates. Gold is rising like the Fed is going to be cutting rates. Oil prices are rising like a major war is coming. And tech stocks are rising like there's no problem at all, unquote. And so if I ever sound confusing, like if if you're watching someone or listening to someone, they don't sound confused to you. 
it is just my personal belief that they're lying to you. Like I, I make zero sense of what's going on right now. And I don't think many people out there do. And the ones who do, I don't think they're yapping about it on the internet. So if you're listening to someone who a hundred percent knows what's happening, just please take that with a grain of salt. Because also the worst part is that everyone who like the people who I have on, on uh, as interviewees, all of whom people would, you know, great achievements. They're known people in their field when one way or another, they all have, they all have good arguments. Like they often support those arguments by data about why their prediction is what's going to come right. They say, oh, but no, the Fed is going to cut because this, and then this and this and that. And then there's a hundred years of data and you can look at that data like that. And I ran it through an algorithm. That's what it came out. And I'm like, okay, sure. Nice. And then someone else comes on the next day and the next week or whatever. And then they explain the exact opposite thing. And they have just exactly as much data, right? And so being me, slightly below average intelligence, that doesn't really help in, in making my own choices. So I just tend to 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 sort of agree with everybody and and that's what it comes out. Like it exactly what, what this tweet says is sort of my my understanding of what's happening, which is to say that that it's absolutely confusing. Please do follow the Cabasi, the fatigue letter on Twitter, Cabasi letter. Uh, the, again, nothing as insightful could have come out of my brain. So they deserve all the credit for this. And they do provide good quick bites on Twitter and, and more on their website. Not sponsored. This is not an ad, by the way. That's not sponsored by them. Maybe I should. But yeah, I'm just thankful for the comment. And so um, for, for the tweet, actually, not for the comment. But so, yeah, it's it's confusing out there. And I'm not covering any more of that this week because it's a. This is probably a long commodity-focused episode, as as it should be on a channel called Resource Talks. And I also feel that that's enough macro for me, at least for the next 74 seconds. So uh, let's talk commodities instead. I'm going to start with gold. That that gold was the main topic du jour, if you will. It did an interesting move in the commodity space. It closed above 2,000 uh, again. And and luckily for you, I'm not I'm not alone to talk about it. I've got someone who's going to make my mom jealous here. Not only because of his looks, but also because he happens to be an engineer, while also being a geologist and an economist. He's got three degrees in all those fields, uh, as well as he's a CEO already. So he's a CEO of O3 Mining, which O3 Mining is a gold exploration company with assets in Canada, by the way. And they are a supporting advertiser on this channel. But so to talk to me about the valuations and risks of gold and gold stocks, uh, we're going to have to listen to Jose Vizquera. All right, Jose, I'm um, I'm catching you on an interesting week here as gold has surpassed and closed above $2,000 an ounce, uh, still about a percent and a half below its all-time highs that it hit in 2020, but still above the that you know magical number, if you will, of, of $2,000 an ounce. However, gold stocks closed the, closed the week uh, lower with both the GDX and the GDXJ down 1% for the week. Your stock was up 3.5% for the week. And so this is related to the first article that I want to cover here with you. It comes from Market Watch, and uh, it reads, quote, Gold is officially outperforming stocks in 2023 as October rally continues. I'm not going to read the whole article because it says exactly what the title says, only in about 800 more words. And But what's more interesting, though, to me is that... Uh, like the, looking at the GDXJ in a longer term time frame, or the GDX, excuse me, not necessarily the GDXJ, but the GDX is down close to 40% since gold's all time high in 2020. And, and your stock is close is down close to 60% since 2020 when gold was at that same level that we're at right now. What, what, do, you, what do you make of this movement? Let's, let's maybe start here. What do you what do you make of this move here where gold is going up? It's close to all time highs. It's outperforming the Dow Jones, S&P and even the NASDAQ. Um, it's up about 20% uh, over the last 52 weeks. But at the same time, not many of the equities are following and are still much lower than they are in than they were in 2020. What do you make of all this? Well, my first impression is that this is not atypical in the sense that what the, the markets, I want to believe they are more efficient than what we want to believe. And what happens is that we have seen $2,000 before. And went down quite quite fast after that, a couple hundred bucks. So in my view, we would not see stocks following gold until gold has not been breaking these levels for a for a substantial amount of time, for for for, for a meaningful amount of time. We're talking a week, two weeks, three weeks. We're not going to see the stocks following the gold price yet. It will come. Uh, we have seen that in 2008, 2009, uh, towards 2011, we did see gold moving with the stocks better. 
uh, although there has always been a discrepancy between the gold price and the stocks as, as, as a correlation. Um, it has never been at par, that is, uh, that is for sure. And, and I think right now we're living a very uh, particular situation, if we want to call it, with what is happening right now in the Middle East. If we want to do any uh, exercise for understanding this, I think possibly this can only be compared to what happened years ago when when the United States attacked Iraq. Um, th then we're talking about two, let's call it wars in the Middle East and uh, gold prices moving, no? Because mm. in this case, remember, gold price is going to be not only... Uh, looked into the fact that gold is going up but oil will go up as well because now now you're touching a very particular nerve of of the of the middle east and that with that comes a lot of higher costs so right. the market is already interpreting okay gold is high but you know if if this is going to come together with oil prices being higher which means that still will be higher, which means that a lot of the components that you will need for mining will be higher. Therefore, you know, we're going to wait. That's what the market is saying. We're going to wait. We're going to wait and see how does this end reveal in order for everything to be packed. That's a very good point. That's probably the point uh, that really matters right now. And it also leads nicely into the second headline that I wanted to discuss this week. Uh, it's a report, actually, an S&P report that I saw on, on someone tweeted it out, I believe. And in the report, researchers were talking about you know cost overruns. Uh, and then, well, they were really talking about CapEx. I made cost overruns off of it because it was CapEx growth in the mining industry, right? And so the verdict was that CapEx will grow 6.2% in 2023. And you might think, okay, that's actually good. That's, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's above inflation. So we're putting more money uh, into building these actual mines. But you also look at the average CapEx increase over 2021 and 2022, and you see that those were respectively 13.8% and 16.3%. Uh, so you, again, you can say that, okay, that's CapEx growth. It's not inflation because this is aimed at growing production. But for one of the biggest spenders on, on, on this list and, and one of the biggest spenders um, in the world, that being BHP, it hasn't really grown production all that much. Neither has Rio Tinto, for example, when you look at their iron ore production, for example. Now, if we if we move on to look closer at the gold mining costs, so including uh, well, pretty much everything, not necessarily only the all the sustaining costs, but including everything also labor and machines, obviously as well, but and, and energy, of course, as you mentioned, but also legal expenses, taxes, financing costs, and just everything. Yeah, according to the World Gold Council, which I also found this week, uh, we're at, at about $1,300 an ounce as opposed to under $1,000 an ounce last time when gold was at this level. So even though the, 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 the price that those mining companies are getting for their end products have risen, uh, they, you know, they, they've not risen as quickly as their costs. And uh, of course, it's even worse for, for the juniors because you, you guys don't even have revenues. But it's still pushing. It's pushing your stock prices down, and it's also push, pushing your your financing um, cost up for that matter. So, what, what do you think about the argument that the valuations that you guys are seeing are are actually justified, and that that maybe they should even be lower because of this situation? It's just not very friendly to anyone who's trying to put a mine into production. So, you know, capex is a. Uh, uh certainly a very interesting topic to talk about and i think that together with capex you have to make distinctions on where are you going to be analyzing capex uh what i mean by that is that you the difference why you have some stocks that are more appreciated than others has to do these days definitely with jurisdiction and with jurisdiction comes two things that I think are extremely important in our industry in particular. One is the rule of law. Are you going to have a clear understanding of what are the next steps that you will have to follow in order to get a permit? Do you have predictability or not? And that is the difference between a more stable country that has the rules very well clear very well put 
the don't change where you can predict things and allows you to be better prepared and those ones that are not that's number one and two with capex comes as well what are going to be in in particular in in the case of mining the different costs associated with the ancillary infrastructure what i mean by that is if i build a mine in valdor in the golden valley of quebec i have railroads and roads and airport and water and manpower if i build a mine in the middle of mali then i may have to build the road i may have to build the tension power i may have to build a lot of ancillary infrastructure that makes the capex even higher so in terms of capex yes it will go higher there is no doubt the capex will go higher and it has always been the case because you have a couple of components that are going to be very well uh, immediately directed with mining and those are still and then once you enter into production energy and uh and those are the two things that we have to to, to be very cautious you know 30 percent of, of of the cost in any in any productivity in any in any industry really uh it's 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 attached to to energy so is that the case is that the case for the for the gold industry too because if it's 30 percent and if that's 30 percent of your cost let's say the uh, you know, the oil price or whatever goes up 50% or something crazy like that. That almost makes or breaks your whole operation. Well, uh, again, depends on where you are. Um, if you're in Quebec, you're going to have hydroelectric power. doesn't matter. Mm. But if you are now in the middle of the jungle of Colombia, you will be burning oil. Then your prices are to a roof. Mm. Yeah. That's a bit, so that so jurisdiction. You know what you're you're making me think here, which is it's a it's a Sunday for the record. So thinking is not my my strong suit in any day of the week, but let alone Sunday. But so because when I think about jurisdiction, I'm thinking about political risk most of the time. I I, I don't necessarily think about it that way. But you make obviously an outstanding point that is connected to energy, and and there's something else though. That, so the, there is still the political risk, and that that relates to the the third headline that I wanted to go here it's um this week it's a it's a reuters headline where it reads quote panama orders halt to new mining projects as uh street protests grow since then by the way unquote but since they by the way those protests have um uh, have spilled into 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 the actual ocean so it's not only on the streets and to give a little feedback to the people listening cobra panama uh is a is a mine in panama it's a very very large open pit copper mine um, well, again, obviously in Panama, that's why Cabri Panama. Uh, and but uh, there was a bunch of drama around it. For it's been a bunch of drama around it for months now, which has just uh, this week it, it has concluded in in the signing of a deal, basically that ensures that the country receives three hundred and seventy five million dollars annually. So that's three seventy five million dollars in additional taxes every year uh, out of one mine. This accounts for about five percent of the whole the whole economy of the entire country. And so this deal will allow the mine to operate for another 20 years. And now uh, the contract has a clause in there that allows them to potentially expand beyond that period. Maybe, maybe not. So you might think, okay, finally, right? Great. It's it's a salty, it's an expensive deal, but it's done. They'll be fine. Mining is back on track. All good. Well, it turns out that the locals don't necessarily agree with that. And they don't, they don't want the $375 million annual. They want the mine to be gone. They want it to go away because... Well, they're concerned about the environment and whatnot. So, for example, schools were even closed this week so that kids can go to to protest that mine. So they take them out of schools, put them on you know on boats and whatever um, to block the export of ore and, and and whatnot. So, and that's not even the biggest news out of this news release. The biggest news here is that Panama is uh, going forward will will actually reject all of the new mining projects. So if you look at companies who are thinking of applying or have already applied for permits they're not going to get them that's basically that's basically what they're saying and so why i'm bringing this up i in this talk with you is because this is yet another one of those risks you know red tape has also grown a whole lot since 2020 and while sure you have um like in canada there's roads and there's access to energy that's um the red tape is growing all over the place in in all countries together with political risk and that has a 
monetary value too. So how do you look at how do you look at well sure this, this specific situation with Cobra Panama? If you want to talk to me about that, do talk to me about it. But how do you look at the growing red tape risk in relation to the valuations of mining and exploration companies? Well, first of all, I, I think it's very unfortunate what is happening in uh, in Panama. And and I would say that it was unfortunate from the very beginning. I mean, the fact that you are renegotiating contracts that were already signed doesn't help Panama, period. Uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with mining. You are renegotiating a contract. I mean, you are telling people, come to Panama, build your business. And by the way, in a couple of years, if you do well, I'm going to take more from you. Mm. Now, you tell me how many more people want to go and do business. This is only from a business standpoint of view. Forget about getting yet into the environmental side of things, which, by the way, um, in my experience, has never been only environmental. And there has always, especially in Latin America, a component of an ideology of, of thought. And in general, either with a very populist thinking or being extreme uh, left. And there has always been a relationship between that and, and the, the environmentalists. Different from maybe other places in the world, in Latin America, green and red are always very close. It's almost as having a watermelon. It's <laughs> green outside and red inside. Very red. That's a good point. That's a good point. It well, is, it, it, so that's the unfortunate part. No, go I, ahead. I, I do think that it's very important to understand the whole concept context of what could be Cobre Panama. I will be very interested to know who is financing this protest. Stopping kids from going to school? Is, is, is it more important to go and protest? Kids that probably don't even know why they are protesting? Mm. So if my kid, which is 10 years old, is going to protest, I would not be upset with him. I would be upset with his professor, the director, and possibly the major of the, of the city. You, you are com you you are confusing things. So, but but that again doesn't necessarily negate the the risk of growing red tape around the world. Like I think this is the most obvious example, and it happened this week. That's why we're worthy of talking about. But growing red tape is just it, it's a thing, and the expenses are going up, right? I mean, uh, I assume most places legal expenses would be going up. Is that not the case? It's like I I again I I don't know what is the economics behind there has to be a behind the amount of money that is going into these groups that are anti-business in, in in a sense yeah. it, it's quite substantial um we're, we're not talking only about panama it happens here in canada it happens in peru it happens in colombia you know, in, in some cases, yes, there have been mistakes being done in the past. In some cases, there has been mistake environmentally talking about that, that has happened in the, in the recent uh, years. Um, but if we compare that in the very big scheme of things with anything that has to, and if we want to compare industries, mining and agriculture, the amount of, you know, damage that is being created right now in agriculture only by the pesticides that are being used in different countries, especially in poor countries, or the amount of of um, of, of changing in genes that they are doing that are affecting the the environment and humans, it's it's way more. But there is no money there. You know that's that's why I keep thinking about you know what what do you win by that? What, what where is where is the win? And 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 the win I I, I don't I don't buy the idea that we're fighting for the environment and only the environment. Mm. No, no, doesn't make sense. No, of course not. Of course not. But, but it doesn't make sense. But, but it growing. seems like it's a reality. Yeah. It's growing, and 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 that means that you know mining companies needs to spend more time on doing the groundwork with the different uh, stakeholders. Meaning by that, 
the people around your mind, the people that are surrounding your mind, the same NGOs, government, etc. I mean, there is way more work that has to be done that before you didn't need to do that. That goes to your cost. That's part of your, pretty much of your operating cost. Your operating cost is not anymore just focusing on being productive. Hmm. Right. right. And that goes back to what you said there is why are the stocks not following um, because they want, you know, gold market participants are not buying the stocks. That's why the stocks are not following gold. But why are why, why are the stocks not following gold is because they want to see gold going above and, and staying above, a, a, a you know, to, not 2000 alone, but maybe even more to justify to to justify the margin on these businesses, basically. And it so will come, it will come with vengeance. If we think about it for a second, no? I mean, gold, say 2000 and I think it was 13 or 14 uh, or, or even 12 that reached the close to the 2000s, like the 1800s. If we take that and we only start adding inflation into that, we should be today like a 2500 bucks gold. And we're not. Uh, only on the basis of that. And if we take today where we are and from where they went to 2012, we should be in the order of $3,000. So, yes, gold price is good. Is it very high? No. When is it going to run? No. Equities are going to follow gold and it's going to be very fast, but it will only be at the moment that the market for gold in something has already assumed, okay, this will stay here. This is not a one-time week, two weeks. No, no, no. This this is now changing. Right, right. And, and it, it again goes back to the point that we that we are making here. Sort of is is that you should not only be adding inflation to that mix, you should also be adding the new risks, which all of those risks they have a monetary value. And so that's sort of what where it, it it gets confusing to me because it means that gold should be going higher to incentivize new production and to keep the industry going. But at the same time, it also means that it's going to be high. Uh, it's going to be tougher for for the producers to make money, or for the companies like yours that need financing to maybe get that financing. And can, can you talk to me maybe about that? Because you know you're constantly in the market, as every other junior looking for financing. How is how is financing a gold company now at two thousand dollars versus what it was pre COVID, where gold was what seventeen, eighteen hundred, whatever it might have been. How's, how's financing? So go, going back to your question, because I think it's important to, to, to leave that clear. This concept is not, 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 not happening only to go with this idea of the, of the red tape. It happens to copper, it happens to iron ore. It, it is happening to the industry in general. And uh, even top some of the, the oil projects as well. So, I mean, uh, again, I, 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 I keep talking about this watermelon. I mean, where, 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 where is really, what's the reality here? And it's happening. It has to be managed. It is part, going to be part of the cost. But, I mean, at some point, we as, as individuals uh, will have to say, hey, stop. I mean, you know, you, you are going to destroy the circular economy in, in, in the verge of what? Mm-hmm. And, and that's a more philosophical question, if you want to call it. But, you know, circular economy is something that we all should be thinking about. Uh, because you may destroy a part of it and you may think that you're doing well, but you may be destroying the whole route of it, which will create a much bigger problem. That's one part. Uh, going back to gold and how much it affects the, uh, the the junior mining certainly is very complicated to raise money these days. It is probably one of the most difficult times that I have seen in my career um, in, to, in, in terms of uh, raising money, but not only raising money. I mean, capital available, capital availability. There is no capital availability. Right now, uh, we have seen some funds being closed. Uh, we haven't seen yet influx of money coming into the funds. That goes to this concept that I was telling you. People are waiting for gold to be really staying there. When you talk to the family offices, which at the end are the, are the money that comes into the industry, mm. they are telling us, well, I mean, I, I, I don't think gold will stay there, you know, or some of them said it will, but I want to be cautious. And before I start again, opening a position in gold or having a position in gold, I need to make sure that this is going to be there for quite some time. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's circular. It's, it's, it's the same. We're going to go around the same theme, but step back 
it is very difficult right now to get money. The only way to get money is to convince a fund manager that your project is so, so good that he should sell something that he has to buy yours. That's mm -hmm. how competitive it is. And for a fund manager to do that, you really have to excel and, and be able to tell him that. Now, I believe as well that the mining projects, or if you want to call the mining companies, will be differentiated almost in three, uh, or, in, or in two, really. The ones with fundamental value, and they have to convince you the fundamental value is there. Um, let's say your market cap is, like, same, same my case. Our market cap is $100 million. Our net present value is pretty much $500 million. It's a, it's a 5x. Okay. Yeah. But with that, I don't think I can convince anyone. But if you have a second leg, with, which is a transactional side of it, something where the money can be done from one moment to another, something that has to do with a catalyst, either a takeover or a particular event that could happen that can transform the company and then what depends on you taking that risk or not. Going back to your point, we have a project that will cost $400 million to be built. But if we manage to convince one of the groups that are around us and they can process the ore, my capex goes in half. Now, you as an investor have to say, okay, do I believe this guy telling me this or not? And if you do, then you, know, you are betting for a transaction. You're betting for a particular event, not for a fundamental value. Right? So then you have these two opportunities on how you will make your investment. And this applies to other companies in the world and how the different funds will be making their goal. What, what I'm trying to say by that is you will have funds that are based on fundamental value and you have the hedge funds. They're going for a transaction. So, and, and, and that's where you could be tapping to get some money. Right, right. You you make another good point here that is that that right now is not the time like in, in, in none of those cases I heard you say, Oh, just buy whatever gold stock out there because right now is the time to be picky because not everybody's gonna weather the storm that we've been in for so long. Because again, then you mentioned financing being hard. And so you have to have one of those two things that you explain. That's uh it's a good point. But out of those out of those risks that we just talked about, what do we do? We talked about um, so cost, inflation, whatever. Talk about growing red tape. We talked about uh, financing. We didn't talk about labor. I don't know how you're experiencing the risk of labor, but out of those risks, what do you? What, what is sort of the, the the largest risk right now threatening gold companies that you think investors should watch out for? So let me let me go back to to this concept of cost because I think it's it's, it's very important to have something in mind that will will will. will help your audience to, to think about a couple of things. When we talk about cost in mining, the important thing is not if cost went up 20% or if cost went up 100%. Yes, it seems to be very important. But the most important part is where you are with that income, if you want to call it, with, with that situation, where you are in the curve. What I'm, what I'm talking by that is, if I can be in the first quartile here, if cost runs 100%, these guys that are on the top, like these guys are close to the 1,500 bucks gold, they will be out of business. Then there is a re-equilibration there between supply and demand. Then even if, if cost went up 100%, as long as I was part of the first quartile, I will survive and I'll make more money than anyone else. So yes, the cost is important, but competition and efficiencies is more important than the rest. And that's where jurisdiction matters so much. The rule of law matters so much. The fact of having manpower that it is prepared to do mining matters so much. And this is a segue to, to manpower. Uh, cost. As, as, as we have seen, cost of living has been more expensive uh, as part of you, the cost as, as well as many of the different um, parts of mining goes up. Um, certainly, labor will go up and it is going up. And if it doesn't go up, we will have a, a social crisis in the world in general. So, you know, people cannot afford houses. People are having more trouble to buy food. Uh, 
you know, governments need to do a better job in that regard as well. Um, but that's more political, no? so I don't want to enter into that field. Well, they sure do. If anything, they sure do. So, out of those risks, what were you? What do you? What do you see? What do you encounter the most? Like, what, what's the biggest risk out of those ones that we discussed so far today? To me, the biggest risk is the change of rules. To be sincere, because if you have clear rules, then you know that you will look for an asset until that fits within those rules. But if those rules are going to be changed in the middle, then what is left? All right, and then on to Uranium now. Uh, it was another interesting week. A whole lot of things happened. There was a conference. We talked about valuations and whatnot. So again, not alone. I talked to uh, Justin Hewn. He's a publisher of the Uranium Insider. So it makes sense to listen to him, uh, to, to his thoughts about uh, Uranium. Again, take, take everything with a grain of salt from anything and everybody on the internet out there. And in the end, always make your own decision. This is not just a disclaimer. Um, but it is something that, I mean, if you don't like losing money, you should be you should be aware of. But let, let's listen to Justin here. All right, Justin, we uh, finally surpassed the previous cycle highs. Uh, and this is as in the, the, the 2011 highs, uh, the 2011 cycle. I know a lot of people don't see it as, as a, a cycle, you know, from sort of 29 to 2011. But it was it's not a massive cycle, but it was a cycle. So we've surpassed those highs in the uh, uranium spot price. Not inflation adjusted yet, but what I mean by that is that uranium is above $74 right now. Last time that it was here was the spring of 08 on its way down. Uh, before it started going back up again in 2011, where it was stopped by Fukushima, yada, yada, yada. Well, what's happening here, really? But that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, well, what's happening here is we're having a kind of a, a geopolitical influenced uh, concern about supply, I think is, is, is part of what's happening. And of course, just the natural cycle of the sector is also what's happening. So this has been predicted for a very long time that this uranium goes through these very, very extreme cycles. And it has historically, and, and now we believe is, is nothing different from that. So you go through a period of time and it's kind of classic commodity cycle. It's it's really, in some cases, no different than any other commodity with a few exceptions where it's very different from every other commodity. Um, but just like all other commodities, you know, <clears throat> you go through a period of oversupply, the price falls. It falls to the point where producers don't make money anymore. They bring supply offline, stagnates for a while. Eventually, demand rebounds. The price starts to move again. Producers come back, uh, you know, rinse and repeat. Uh, eventually, you get to over, you know, overpriced conditions in whatever the commodity is, and that brings a lot of supply online. Eventually, and that produces a situation where the price then falls again, or there's some exogenous event that causes the price to fall, like a demand destruction event, uh, like the Fukushima. Um, or like the Japan's response to the Fukushima reactor uh, meltdown. So <clears throat> we're sort of just in this up cycle part of the cycle, which is completely natural. And utilities have a decent amount of uncovered needs going out towards the end of the decade. And they're coming back to the table and contracting in pretty significant volumes, especially on a relative basis compared to previous years or the previous 10 years. And you also have this uh, very unique situation where you have supply essentially really uh, fragile and, and in limited quantities for a period of time. And there's a bunch of nuance around that that I can get into. But basically, we're just experiencing a normal commodity cycle. But because it's uranium and it moves extremely slow and supply is very, very slow to respond, you tend to have these price overshoots. And I think that that's probably what we're in the midst of right now. Um, we believe the uranium price is headed much higher still, even at $74 a pound here in you know late October. But uh, yeah, it's we're just right in the middle of that cycle, the price going higher to A, incentivize new production, and potentially far beyond that, depending on how concerned the buyers of the commodity are about future supply. Mm. The stocks so far have responded differently to now we've obviously surpassed the spot prices surpassed the previous high of like but was it two years ago give or take uh meaning of, of this current cycle so we're back at a, at a at a new high for this cycle but the stocks are not and also this week even though the the etfs were issuing shares and whatnot uh, stocks are still well, basically flat if you judge by the urnm if i'm not mistaken so what is why are where the stocks not responding to the optimism well, I think that basically everybody is bearish right now on just equities in general, just general equities markets bearishness, I think is having an effect. 
So we've seen this a few times over the past few years, especially when it comes to ETF flows, where we've actually seen the price movement of the ETFs move sideways or down as there were considerable inflows into the EFs, ETFs. And every time that's happened, it's portend, portended a move to the upside. Um, it, it basically equals accumulation. And when you have flows coming in, into the ETFs, but the price is moving sideways, basically what you're having is um, selling of the individual holdings of those ETFs. And to some extent, some selling of the ETFs that's matching off the buying that's coming in. But the fact that they're issuing shares um, is, is a sign that there's some accumulation happening here. There absolutely is a rotation of money happening here. Whether or not that buffers, um, let's say, some extreme bearish action in the broad markets, if we do see that, you know, this week has been pretty bearish across broad markets, but it hasn't, of course, been anything resembling a crash per se. But yeah, I think it's just overall market sentiment that's affecting the equities. And, and if you look at equities pricing, you know, you chart... Uh, any given individual miner uh, and look at the price of that particular stock compared to, let's say, the autumn 2021 highs, even though a lot of these stocks are even or slightly lower, some of them are slightly higher, <clears throat> but a lot of them are still below the 2021 highs. All of these stocks, uh, with probably very few exceptions, have different share counts. So if you're looking at a total market capitalization, generally speaking, we've surpassed those autumn 2021 highs. It's just a matter of the divisor in terms of shares outstanding has changed. So, uh, and then just that that bearishness in the background, like absolutely everybody is bearish on the broad market. And that uh, that's certainly having an effect on the equities, mm. in my opinion. I also wanted to talk about the valuations of the equities too, specifically because uh, there's something Cuppy said online this week on, on Twitter. He, he put out a tweet. I don't remember exactly what they were talking about. It's, it doesn't really matter here. But then someone said something among the lines of, okay, this is good news for uranium, for the uranium price, but when are the equities actually going to start moving? And Cuppy said uh, never, saying that uranium stocks were overvalued. And so a couple of people thought that was sarcasm or that he was kidding, but apparently he wasn't because someone asked and he said, no, I'm not kidding. I really think they're overvalued. And, and like if, if you're... um. If you're a broad, broad, broad market money manager, and you look at those, and you look at a P ratio, wherever you might be looking in your models on on Cameco, it doesn't make much sense if you value it that way. Um, but I know you don't think they're overvalued, so maybe you can talk to me about how you look at them to sort of justify the valuations that they're seeing now. Um, well, I think some of them are overvalued, definitely. Um, but generally speaking, I think people on Twitter put way too much weight into. Um, the opinions of of others, they really should just kind of do their own work and and come to their own opinions. And Cuppy, of course, Cuppy's a character. You know, he likes to he likes to stir the pot. He likes to get people frothed up about things. He likes to tweet about um, you know political issues that he knows are going to you know raise the hairs. And so that's that's just how Cuppy is. And of course, everybody on Twitter talks their book with no exception. And you have to consider that too. So he's obviously been very bullish on the commodity itself <clears throat> via uh, ownership of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. And that's worked out well for him. He does own some miners as well. You can look at his funds, 13Fs. Uh, so he's the fact that he's saying, you know, they're all overvalued. He's obviously just trying to stir things up. Um, you know, there's, there's a company, for example, I'm not going to mention which company it is. It has a valuation of over $2 billion US. Um, the, the, the folks that are running the company have never produced a pound of uranium in their entire career. And, uh, they are likely to, well, maybe they'll produce this cycle, but you know, I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, you know, and there's, and there's valuations. You can say that there's, there's companies that have a four X valuation of another company, both developing, both with similar production profiles. So you have to find the value in the space. There's certainly overvalued, uh, equities and there's certainly undervalued equities here. But you know you can look at general metrics to compare equities uh, to see relative valuation between uh, the equities themselves. Uh, just you know a metric, something like enterprise value compared to their their in situ resources. And if you go back to 2006, for example, when there still was kind of a blow off top ahead of the sector, the companies on average were trading for you know eight or nine dollars a pound on the ground. <clears throat> and you adjust that for inflation from 06, and that's probably fifteen you know fifteen dollars a pound on the ground. The equities are nowhere near that valuation here. So on, on a historical basis, they're very undervalued compared to the previous cycle. If you look at traditional valuation metrics, 
uh, or valuation type calculations doing forward cash flow analysis, things like that, then yes, there's certainly companies that are far undervalued and far overvalued. You just have to be choosy to where you put your money if you're making those investments on an expected valuation basis. Of course, as we've talked about many times in the past, movements of the stocks in this space largely are dictated by, by just general capital flows into the space and into the ETFs in particular. So, <clears throat> you know, when you see commodities bull runs, oftentimes towards the end of the bull market, when everything's really frothed up, you'll have valuations that make zero sense whatsoever and they'll get way, way, way overvalued. But you can find some development companies that will be producing in this cycle that are trading very, very low in terms of valuations, especially relative to peers. So in my opinion, the valuation argument uh, as far as overvalued, undervalued is sort of missing the point generally. You're sort of betting on is is the commodity moving higher and flows eventually uh, moving into the sector. And they are moving in the sector, not eventually or theoretically. It is it is actually happening. We just happen to be set against a backdrop of a, of a bearish broad market. If you compare that to the previous cycle, you know, the big move for the commodity 04 to 07 was when the broad market was in a raging bull market as well. So we have a different backdrop in terms of overall investor sentiment across all markets currently. And that's certainly affecting things. Mm. And it's also when when people start thinking about when when are the stocks are when are the stocks finally gonna start moving is that uranium stocks are uranium, but they are stocks. So they're uranium right. stocks and they're stocks first. But it also at the same time, if you look at um if you look at relative performance on whatever you want to do, you want to do the, the GDX ETF, for example, that's up 15% on an annual basis. Um, if you want to do the, the, the copper ETF, COPEX, that's 14%. Um, looking up the silver ETF, that's down actually 5% on a year. The Dow Jones dipped in uh, negative territory this week. Now it's back up a little bit, but it's it's uh, only up 1.7% on a year adjusted for inflation. That's still negative. Uh, and then you look at the URNM ETF, that's up 30% over the last 52 weeks. It's up 40% year to date. Um, the URNJ is a relatively new ETF, so maybe not not that well, I mean, maybe, maybe not that good to, to compare to other stuff, but if you, the URNM is generally what people would use when it comes down to looking at the ETFs or relative performance. And so the stocks are moving. I mean, 40% year-to-date performance is nothing to 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 complain about, maybe in relation to people's expectations, as in this is the best bull market of our lifetimes or whatever it might be, yet the stocks are only up 40%. How does that make sense? And again, what you mentioned is that, as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, the broad market dictates that. And so once we get more optimism in the broad market, potentially a rate cut or whatever it might be, um, we should also start seeing the uranium equities perform much better, still outperform all the other uh, like broad market equities, but also perform much better than what they have so far. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think really during during times like this, in terms of overall investor sentiment and you know fear in the markets, you, you have to look at relative performance more than you know performance on 100% basis. So if you look at you know like URNM charted against uh, the S and P year to date, it's outperformed the S and P by 30%. Um, it's a pretty incredible outperformance. <clears throat> so you sort of have to be happy with that sort of move in this environment, even though. Uh, you know, if you're disappointed that stocks aren't higher based on the price of, of the commodity move. As anybody that's been in the sector for a couple of years, uh, and we've seen the way the commodity has moved this year and the fact that we see, look at the charts and see that most equities are, are at or below previous highs, that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. But there's there's plenty of relative things you could look at. I mean, you could look at just inflation adjusting to the previous cycle. You know, the previous cycle is $74 a pound was 40 bucks a pound and it still ran to 130. And there was huge upside for the equities um, still during that period. And and so many elements of this bull market are different and in far better from a fundamental perspective than the previous cycle. So uh, we still think uh, we're relatively early. We're not at the beginning of this. And this is not a contrarian bet. And the contrarian bet was everybody hates this sector nobody wants to invest in it that's a contrarian bet now we're looking at 
um, an, an embracing of nuclear across the world and, you know, year one of a contracting cycle. So we still think there's a lot of upside ahead of us. Certainly we're, there's some buffeting that's happening based on, you know, investor, overall investor sent broad market action. That's completely out of our control, you know, just focusing on the physical market and, and choice equities, then we can come up with, with a thesis that's, that, you know, we believe, like I said, there's incredible upside still, especially for the commodity. And eventually we think the, the equities catch up, uh, but looking at on a relative basis, you know, you can chart something like, a you know, you are in J compared to Cameco. And I know you are has not been around very long, but it doesn't hold Cameco. It doesn't hold Kazadin problem. Uh, doesn't hold Paladin and everything else is is in this ETF in terms of the uranium sector, except for the micro caps. And we've seen that rotation. So we're starting to see this rotation out of the large caps and into the into the mid and small cap developers and explorers. It is happening. It's a few months into that rotation. Um, and then, of course, according to industry contacts, you know, there, there absolutely is a rotation of money happening. There's money managers and there's advisors that are talking with, with funds that have uh, become interested in this story. Is it on the front pages of investing, uh, investing newsletters and investing uh, publications? No, we're not there yet. So we're not seeing a huge, huge rotation of money, but it is happening and it's happening slowly. Mm. Were there any, any money managers at the, and, and any, N E I. That's like whenever there's an A, an I, and an E next to each other, it's really confusing for Europeans. But so N E I <laughs> conference. What did you? Uh, what, were there any many money managers there? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, I mean, it was primarily an industry conference, so you had utilities and fuel buyers and folks that worked in across the fuel cycle. But there was a decent representation on the investing mm -hmm. side of things. Yeah. What What's sort of the level of of I mean, did you speak to any of them? And and if you did, what sort of the level of knowledge that they have? Like, I want to know if they're already really knee deep and like understand this industry as well as you do, or do they have sort of the the five year old understanding that I have? Well, I think if you're managing money and you're and you're flying to North Carolina to attend a conference that's specific to the uranium fuel cycle, you probably have a decent idea of what you're into already. So there was mostly very high level information being shared and conversations being had. So the money managers that I spoke to that were there already get it. And they're primarily there to uh, build and maintain connections with people in the industry. But, you know, I talked to a couple of money managers that were there and um, you know, their, their reasoning for attending this conference, which I suppose from an investing perspective is anybody's reason for attending a conference is to kind of gauge where we're at, right? You want to, you want to kind of get the mood in the room and figure out, okay, what is wrong with this thesis? Uh, what am I not seeing? And ask those questions and make sure that you can come away with some idea of where we're at in the cycle. Uh, because obviously we're well off the bottom in terms of the commodity and the equities. How much further do we have to go? That's the big question. And um, my takeaway in terms of that question is I don't see anything that is going to keep the price down in the near term and even in the midterm. So it was very reinforcing for the views that we already have. And that probably has a lot to do with the fact that we have connections, um, pretty deep connections in the industry and do a lot of deep work on the sector. So we have a, a good grasp of it already, but still going to this conference and connecting with people that work in the industry and with other money managers, uh, trying to gauge where we're at and where we're at is I don't see what influences a downward movement in the price anytime soon. And probably when I say soon, I'm talking years. Hmm. What was the every time I, I I go to a conference with my wife, we on the way back we we talk about what did you experience, so on and so forth, and then we each come up with a with with a word basically that that we heard the most during the conference. As often oftentimes like a catchphrase or something used throughout the conferences. Was there something that like in this case, like I don't know, enrichment, production, security of supply, outages, something along those lines, like a word that you really heard heard coming back. Uh, that's, that's hard to, to put it into a single word, but I can tell you some themes that were repeated throughout various panel discussions during okay. the conference. Um, well, the first theme really was <clears throat> optimism for nuclear. So, and I actually tweeted about this and shared this in the update that I did for, for our members yesterday. Um, but at former past NEI conferences, there would actually be a table, uh, at the conference, they would highlight all of the premature closures for nuclear reactors. 
And they, they called it the table of shame. And of course, these folks, are, they all work in the industry. They're all very, very supportive of nuclear, very enthusiastic about nuclear for, for many reasons. Um, so this table of shame would would highlight all of the pre, uh, you know, the premature closures for reactors. And in the last five years, we've had a handful in Germany, Sweden shut down some reactors, Belgium shut down some reactors in the US, a couple of reactors shut down. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the head, the director of NEI, when he was uh, speaking on the introduction of the conference, he basically said that table isn't here tonight because there are none. There are no premature closures. There's zero premature closures in the foreseeable future in the world right now. That is new. That is different. That is a big, big shift. And it's it's gone entirely in the other direction to the point where we're actually seeing life extensions and even restarts of shuttered reactors. So that was definitely a theme that was kind of undergirding the entire conference was this buoyant optimism for nuclear. And, and that's a big shift. And you could see it and you could hear it and you could feel it in the room um, that this is finally turned for the sector, for the industry. And that was that was a very nice and positive feeling that kind of underpinned everything that happened at the conference. So that was that was one thing that was that was repeating was just this <clears throat> recognition of how far sentiment has come for nuclear. The other thing that was repeated across various elements of the sector. So this is not only the mining aspect of the sector. So the uranium mining, there was a uranium mining panel and they highlighted this same problem, but uh, for conversion, for enrichment, for building and maintaining nuclear for is basically a, uh, a very challenging shortage of skilled labor. And that was repeated multiple times. <clears throat> so obviously from the investing standpoint, you have to look at the skilled labor shortage. You know, it doesn't look great for building new nuclear in certain areas, right? But really what we're talking about is the demand picture that is stable and growing has pretty much everything to do with the existing fleet and many reactors getting life extended. That's the de-risking of the demand side. So the bullishness that I have for the next two to three years basically has zero to do with new builds at all whatsoever. Um, but on the supply side, that same problem will definitely influence production coming online on time and on budget. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen in mining. That's not a thing that happens in mining basically ever. And uranium is on the extreme end of that as well for obvious reasons. So those were two themes that were repeated many, many times throughout the conference across panels, uh, discussion panels, as well as conversations. Hmm. What about on, on the demand side? There's also a new phenomenon that being the financial players, and there's many new popping up. There's one that is 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 closely related to an an ex uh, Kazanum Prama employee. Was that was that something that was discussed as well or mentioned at all? There wasn't a lot of discussion about that, mainly because the the guys that are launching that fund, the PFYN fund, based out of Singapore, and that's Askar Badarbayev, uh, the former uh, chief commercial officer of. Uh, of Kazadam Prom, um, very, very solid, uh, kind, and just wonderful human being. And his partner, Patrick, I'm forgetting his his last name, my apologies, but they were both at the conference. Um, but they just, because they're so close to launching this fund, there was very little they could talk about. But there was general discussion about the financial influence on the sector. And obviously, the heavy lifting of that has been done by Sprott and is probably behind us. But what that did is it it tightened up the market significantly, and the entire industry recognizes the influence of the financial players as relatively consistent buyers, even if it's low volumes. If they're buying on the margins, that has an effect on the price, especially now when we're seeing relatively low volume trades move the price and sometimes significantly. So it's, it's more of along the lines of we know that there's this element that's there and they will continue to have an influence on the sector rather than a industry fear that all of the pounds are going to be consumed by the financial players. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be that panicked fear. I don't know if it's because there's kind of a, you know, a general bearishness in markets and the industry has recognized that the flows have not been coming into the spot uh, anywhere close to how they were last year and the year before. Um, so that's sort of risk off still on capital markets especially on a relative basis to what they've experienced, but they absolutely know that those entities are there. <clears throat> and there was a presentation by um, uh, Matthew Moore from Curzon Uranium. 
And this was also a very, a very good, well done presentation. And he he highlighted a couple of things, but one of those, of course, is the influence of financial players. And in his opinion, in his presentation is this trend for the financialization of the sector is not going anywhere. Um, so the guys from Curzon basically believe that these financial players are here to stay. They're going to have a, a continued influence on the sector. Um, he also highlighted a couple of things I know we've talked about in the past and and I've talked about many times our membership, which is the effect of enrichment tales on demand. And he shared a, a really shocking chart, which of course we're familiar with this, but a lot of your listeners might not be, is how how much tales assumptions influence demand for for you 308. It's huge. It's huge. So just looking at demand this year is just under maybe 180 million pounds. That's at a tails assumption of 0.22. You bump that up to 0.28 and you get to over 200 million pounds. You know, it's like a 30 million pound swing just by changing this one little number. And it's a it's a much deeper and much more complex conversation than we probably have time for today. But basically, in utilities that are buying now and next year and into 2025, they're feeding that uranium into enrichment contracts that they are signing or have signed in the last year or two with very high tails assays, sometimes potentially higher than 0.3. And that all that means is they have to buy a lot more uranium to get the same amount of fabricated fuel out of the far end of that fuel cycle. And this number is hugely, hugely important and not a lot of people pay attention to it. So I was glad that he brought that up and that triggered a lot of other uh, deeper conversations with folks at this in the at the conference. And it's it's a it's a big, big influence on uranium buying. And, and that's where we're at currently is these very high transactional tails for enrichment contracts have a big influence on how much uranium is going to be purchased. We well, yeah, are bumping it from from in the twos, so like from point twos to the point threes. That that potentially bumps it bumps it by about fifty percent, and then that can be, you know, significant there too. So it's well, it's a fifty percent jump in the number as far as the the uh you know the the U three hundred eight, excuse me, U two thirty five content in the tails to go from point two to point three. That is a fifty percent jump. It's not quite a fifty percent jump in demand for U three hundred eight to feed into that. It's about a. 20 to 25% jump, but that's still very, very large. And so, you know, these tails assumptions, you have to take some balance between operational tails and transactional tails. But the as time goes on, that is more increasingly influenced by the transactional tails number because the new enrichment contracts, you know, from a year ago now and ongoing until there's new capacity, which is multiple years out ahead of us, are going to be very high. And so any utility, you know, signing these enrichment contracts, 0.25 to 0.35, they've got a lot of uranium to buy to fill in those contracts. Mm. Which is why then I assume the geopolitical situation is also a main topic still to this day. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, that that has a, a primarily a big influence on the converters and the enrichers. So there was a, an excellent panel with um, uh, GLE, Centris, Arano, and Urenco. And Arano and Urenco are the two primary Western enrichers. Uh, Centris has some capacity, but um, Arano and, and, and Urenco are the primary enrichers. And then the primary converters are Combernine, Cameco, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Comurex, which is operated also by, Ura uh, by Arano. And so, you know, there were statements like uh, the the director of of, of Converdine, who was on this panel, basically said when they shut down Converdine, uh, the Metropolis plant for six years, that was extremely painful for the company. And they're not about to bring on new capacity just because uh, the financial players want more UF6 so the enrichers can overfeed. Uh, they're not going to do that until and unless they have contracts in place. Now, we have heard over the past couple of months, and especially over the past uh, two weeks with Arano specifically, both Urenco and Arano are expanding enrichment capacity. It's not a huge expansion, but it's uh, significant enough that it will have an effect, but it's multiple years out before that happens. And I think Arano said they were investing 1.7 billion euros to expand 2 million SWU. Um, so that that's going to help, but they also are concerned that, let's say, next month or next year or five years from now, the market effectively de-bifurcates and the Western utilities go back to new business with Russia. And they have a big capacity for both conversion and enrichment that the Western converters and enrichers don't want to destroy their own business by bringing on capacity without having that capacity committed into contracts. So they were basically like, we need more contracts if we're going to expand capacity. And so we're still kind of like at the 
early stages of utilities sort of accepting that what is happening now in terms of this bifurcated market is sort of the quote unquote new normal. I hate to say new normal, but uh, that is something that they're finally recognizing because, you know, a month or two into the, into the Ukraine conflict, it wasn't like utilities were like, okay, let's panic buy into everything because now we're never going to have access to Russian supply anymore. They sat on the sidelines. They, the European utilities, especially maybe six months into the conflict started to buy a lot of enrichment. And that you saw what happened to the enrichment prices and swoo prices. So now we're at this at this crossroads here where it doesn't look like things are settling down in terms of that bifurcation. A majority of the production out of Kazakhstan is going to be consumed by the Russians and the Chinese. And that trend is absolutely not going away. Another point highlighted by Askar. And utilities have bought a lot of enrichment conversion in the last two years, and now they're buying uranium. And there is significant demand for uranium in the market currently, and that's going to continue. And most of the demand that we've seen in terms of the term market this year has come from the EU. And that has that has two primary influences. One, generally speaking, the EU utilities are a little bit more forward looking and they hold a bit more inventory than the US utilities. And two, uh, EU utilities are more reliant on Russian supply than the US. So as this market has effectively bifurcated, a lot of the EU utilities have acted sooner to shore up their supply chains, essentially, with nuclear fuel. Hmm. So I, there were two two contacts that uh, that we met with, both of which independently said, you know, the Americans are coming, uh, just kind of like a, a little soundbite to say that the US utilities have a lot more buying to do, uh, especially compared to the, to the EU and to expect a lot of RFPs to hit the market in the next months. Hmm. It's also that you make a good point uh, without necessarily intend intending to make it, but something I recently understood is that like incentive price is not a magic thing that turns on production. It's, it's, it's that price, but put down on a contract over multiple years and for a certain number of pounds, meaning like it's not that the spot price hits 90 tomorrow and we have production within 18 months turned on no they had there is a process of utilities are going to come out with rfps uh they're going to hit the producers producers are going to negotiate on that that's a process in and of itself that can take according to grant isaac um he, he told me that it could take up to six months that process alone negotiating that contract so incentive price it, this it's not like the spot price hits a price and that's the incentive price and that's already incentivizing new production no that price has to be in a contract that's sort of what i've understood is that right yeah absolutely absolutely and there's you know there's various levels of of development for the development projects so the, so the uranium projects that are closer to actual production they're actually engaging with the utilities and utilities are coming to them like global atomic they announced yet another contract uh, about a uh, six weeks ago in the midst of a coup in the country that the in Niger where their development project exists so there's uh, a lot of risk still around this project getting built and producing uranium yet utilities are coming to them for for supply right um utilities are coming to companies like Lotus that's in uh, operating Malawi and and they've got a, a Karen maintenance asset there, the Kaya Lakira mine that uh, still has a, a couple of years out and a decent amount of money to raise to get that into production. Yet utilities are are willing to step up to the table with them and sign on their terms. Mm. Um, and so you and then you have projects, you know, a lot of these kind of lower grade, larger open pit deposits in Namibia uh, from like Forces and Bannerman and Deep Yellow, where they're not even close to that point of actually signing contracts. And I'm sure utilities are coming to them and looking, you know, 2028 beyond sort of supply and saying, hey, you know, what can we get done? But none of these companies have announced that they've been signing contracts. And so, and, and like, you know, we can just take any of those projects and say, okay, they've got an incentive price of uh, $75. Okay, well, we're basically there. Is a pounds coming out of the ground from these projects in Namibia tomorrow? No, you know, we'd be lucky if it's three to five years for any of these, you know, they still have to have final investment decision. They have to raise the cash. In some cases, there's, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these projects. Um, a lot of capital risk or in a period of time where money is expensive as well. So these companies have to take off on a lot of risk in terms of capital raising for their shareholders. Then they have to go through years of, uh, licensing, permitting, and actually building the mine before they get yellow cake out of the ground. Building the mine and building processing facilities, in some cases, mills or heap leach. 
this stuff takes a lot of time. So you're absolutely right, Antonio. It's We don't just reach that price and all of a sudden pounds fall from the sky. That's not the case. And in terms of inventories, that hasn't been the case. And the, ac- the exact opposite, opposite has been the case during this rise from $18 a pound in 2016 to where we're at now at 74. Uh, inventories have not come into the market uh, in any reasonable volume as we've risen in price. And now we're at uh, you know, 10 year highs in the uranium price and the market is tighter than it's ever been. Not tighter than it's been since I've been watching the market, tighter than it's been ever, ever that we have never seen a market that is this tight. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact we just don't have an inventory overhang in any element of the fuel cycle. This was highlighted by Jonathan Hinsey from UXC in his presentation, which was fantastic. Inventories are not influencing do not have a negative influence on any element of the fuel cycle right now, U308, UF6, or EUP. Um, so there's no down blending. There's no megatons to megawatts. Underfeeding, especially in the West, has basically disappeared. It's an extremely, extremely tight market with the backdrop of a de-risked global nuclear fleet and the Chinese building like crazy. Uh, so it's it's a very unique and, and pretty truly incredible setup here. Hmm. Do you, do you believe, because what I'm thinking about is um, there was a, a news release from UR Energy last week, them saying we're going to have some slowdowns, uh, it's, it's going to take us, it's going to basically take them two years and so on and so forth, but yet they're getting RFPs from utilities, uh, Asian utilities they mentioned, but also obviously North American, European utilities, while well, the Asian part was obviously interesting to me. But what was also interesting to me is, is, their comment on how they are reacting to those RFPs saying that they are demanding basically a premium because those are Western pounds. And that sort of got me thinking about the, uh, again, the idea of bifurcation of the pricing where you might have a West and a, and a, and a East price, if you will. Is that something you, you're also on board with? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's not going to be, let's, I don't think we're going to reach a point where we're actually going to see two different prices being reported, but I absolutely think that there is going to be a premium for those pounds coming from producers that are in jurisdictions that are, uh, you know, easier to access. I mean, in the United States, we have barely any uranium production whatsoever, which is where UR Energy operates, but we have the largest nuclear fleet in the world, at least probably for the next five years or so until the Chinese surpass us. So pounds that exist here are going to have a premium. I I completely agree with uh, Mr. Cash and, um, so, you know, and that might just come in, in, in the realm of like the actual terms of these contracts. So they might be able to sign contracts that are hundred percent market reference, uh, and with a higher ceiling than you might get signing a contract with Kazadam Prom. but then you're going to have to wait longer to get those pounds. Um, unless you're willing to have the, uh, let's say ESG or actual delivery risk and send the pounds through the port of St. Petersburg, they're going to send it West through the Caspian which uh, takes way longer and costs a lot more. So there's kind of a shipping and a risk premium to those pounds, even though the actual production costs are are far lower in Kazakhstan than basically anywhere in the world. Uh, but you know this this trend of, of Chinese buying in front of from uh, Kazakhstan is it's not going anywhere. This was this was highlighted by Askar, and he was he did a, a excellent presentation on uh, Russia and China and like Eastern European and Asian uh, uranium market specifically with U three hundred eight. Talked a lot about Russia and China and, and Kazakhstan, and his words uh, when he was discussing the Chinese the large Chinese contracts with Kazanoprom. Um, basically, that the trend of the Chinese buying most of the uranium coming out of this country is has only just begun. Uh, they are building so many reactors and have an incredible growth trajectory for nuclear. And Kazakhstan is just conven- conveniently right there. They have an outsized influence on the country. They share a, a, a very long land border with China, uh, with, with Kazakhstan. And they're setting up this Alashanku warehouse right on the border. And they're just starting to send uranium there. And eventually, and again, Askar highl- highlighted this in his, pre- his presentation, eventually there's going to be more uranium uh, sent to this warehouse than anywhere else in the world. And and China is setting this up basically for an inventory storage for their own needs. So it's the the big reliable producer in the world, which is Kazakhstan, is going to be increasingly influenced by Russia and China. So yeah, Western pounds are going to have a premium for uh, for Western buyers that are going to be seeking pounds outside of that area of the world, mm. for sure. 
what do you think that price is right now? Is it a good feeling? Any feedback that you've gotten? Rather, it's a rather obscure subject, but what do you? What's your best guess? Well, it sounds to me like contracts that are being signed, let's say for late decade, twenty twenty six seven. Uh, I, you know, a lot of the production for that time period has already been consumed. So twenty twenty seven out into the twenty thirties. What we're hearing is these contracts are entirely market reference which is what the seller wants. They want exposure because they know the price is going higher. So that's that's something that you have to look at as an investor is when you can get leaked out information from these the metrics on these contracts, you have to understand these contracts are discounting the future. So when you hear about contracts that have ceilings in the triple digits, that's because the sellers know that the price is going to go to the triple digits. And that ceiling is protecting the buyer. So if you say, if you say you hear that there's a ceiling at $105 a pound, for example, the buyer knows the price is going higher than that. And that ceiling is protecting that upside for the buyer. And that's a meeting ground between the producer uh, and, and the buyer, right? So what we're hearing is the contracts almost across the board with an exception of development projects that still have to de-risk a little bit, right? So a development project doesn't have the leverage that an actual producer, existing producer does. Existing producers are signing market reference contracts, period, the end, with ceiling floors and ceilings. And those floors are basically what we're hearing now are barely below where the spot price is here. And the ceilings are pushing into the triple digits. But also uh, maybe a, a good point to talk about what West versus Eastern is, is what's happening right now where um, the French president Macron is also apparently on a trip to Central Asia, to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, allegedly trying to secure uranium or whatnot, but surely, and that's not allegedly, surely just to pull Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan out of the Russian hands and into European hands. Um, that's apparently what's happening right now. And then it's funny that that was in, in combination uh, with what came out yesterday on Thursday, but the EDF news about a, a French utility warning about um, outages, at one of their um, bigger, big, well, not bigger, but big power plants. Uh, there's two 1.3 gigawatt reactors there because of um, uh, because of them trying to save about six months worth of fuel before their next scheduled refueling, which apparently uh, stops in 2025. And so that that got a whole a whole lot of people on Twitter very excited, as in, oh. They don't have any more uranium to operate, so they're going to be closing down this uh, nuclear power plant. But as far as I understand, that's not exactly what was happening. Um, but it it sort of falls in in among those um, among the subject line of what we've been talking about. What do you make of this? Uh, well, I hate to burst everybody's bullish bubble, but that story has nothing to do whatsoever with inventories. It just has to do with this particular plant operating at um, a pretty poor capacity factor over the past couple of years, especially last year. And so they basically ran one of the one of the cycles before refueling uh, a bit longer than they typically do. And so that's all it is. It's a nuance that has to do with this one reactor. EDF has plenty of, of enriched uranium and fabricated fuel. So um, no, they're not out of uranium. It has nothing to do with them waiting too long to contract or anything like that. So uh, if you noticed why I wasn't jumping on that train and retweeting that and, and getting all bowled up, it's it's just a nuance about that particular reactor. And there's there's been plenty of problems with EDF's fleet in France because they went for a long period of time in the previous decade where they expected sooner shutdowns before Macron came in and kind of shifted that and did a 180 on, on, on nuclear life extensions and new builds in France. So these plants were, were largely under maintained and that's affected their performance. And, and this is just, this is just a nuance of this particular plant. So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of, there's plenty of concern about supply generally amongst utilities to speak very generally, but this was not evidence of a lack of inventory. Hmm. But when it comes down to France trying to strengthen the, their ties with, with Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan specifically for uranium, is that something that you think is happening or is this just another geopolitical whatever PSYOP trip? Yeah, no, that's that I think that definitely has to do with that uh with that visit. Um I think Kazakhstan is is a, a key a key country in terms of geopolitics in the area that has uh, has to do with more than just uranium, but obviously France has uh, a large reliance on uranium supply because it's the majority of its electricity fleet uh, generation is is nuclear. So yeah, there he's probably I'm sure going to try to shore up relationships there, and 
you know, Arano has had joint venture with Kazakhstan for for quite some time with CACO. And they've got a new mine, which is the South uh, Tortkaduk mine that's going to be producing in the next couple of years. And so I'm sure it's important to shore that up. And especially with uh, concerns around Niger currently for, for France. So basically what we heard at this conference is um, they're still having problems with importing materials into Niger currently. So they actually haven't had interruptions at the mine, but they haven't been able to import the reagents for the processing of the ore. And so uh, that mine, Somer, is basically going to be closing next month until they can uh, bring more material in. Mm -hmm. So certainly they're going to be looking for um, new sources and established sources of uranium that will be reliable into the next decades. And part of that is Kazakhstan. That So that new joint venture mine is very big and important for them especially with the concern in Niger, especially with, you know, a little bit of redu reduced production coming from their joint ventures with Cameco, with MacArthur and Cigar producing a little bit less than they were expecting this year. Uh, and clearly they're looking for for new supply where they can find it. And Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan are the closest and probably the most reliable. <clears throat> but they're going into Mo Mongolia as well and setting up an ISR project there that's been many, many years in the making. And They've had a test plant, a pilot plant that produced about 50% of what they were hoping, but still looks decent enough for them to further that project. And they're shooting for, you know, commercial production late decade, possibly into the early 2030s. So it's a ways away, but yeah, they're trying to shore up this production. And I'm sure that they know, you know, Cigar Lake has, there's a life of mine there. You know, phase one is basically, you know, done in 2027, 2028. Will they go into phase two? That remains to be seen, but yeah, they've got to keep that production coming because they've got life extended fleet as well that they need to feed into. Mm -hmm. What else is happening this week? Seems like we have a, a lot of things happening every week, uh, and I, I seem to miss a lot of it. But what, what else are you seeing out there? Well, I think what I'm watching most is kind of the dynamics in the spot market and recognizing uh, just how quickly, how short lived, and how small the dip was. So we had a 30% run in the uranium price late August through the month of September uh, on, on average volumes. That's very important to understand. This was not, this was not uh, purchasing influenced. This was supply influenced. So you didn't have Sprott or another entity come in and buy 5 million pounds. You had average trading volume for the month of September that we saw, you know, almost a 30% move during that month alone. And so Clearly, you know, conditions in the equities, but also, you know, in the uranium, I think things got a little bit overheated when it hit 73 bucks a pound in pretty short order. Then it cooled off and it started to pull back a little bit. It only pulled back $4. It pulled back to $69 a pound and only for a couple of weeks. And we're already back above where it peaked out. And there was a lot of talk about this actually at this conference that, um, you know, things, when you see a move like that, it's it's easy to be skeptical about it and say, okay, that was a short-lived move. I'm going to fade that. It's going to come right back down. Uh, and it certainly didn't. And so that's that's something that was certainly uh, top of mind for a handful of folks at the conference and uh, a big topic of discussion to see that robust of a move in such a short period of time, not driven by financial players and to only have it correct you know, 5% for a couple of weeks to go right back up above where we peaked out. So that's a tell. That's a big tell. Um, also looking to see a, a number of RFPs come into the market uh, very soon. Now, there's already a handful already there, but we're expecting more based on our uh, conversations at this conference. So uh, we expect there to be a significant run in the uranium price still uh, in Q4 of this year. You know, we've mm -hmm. only got you know six weeks before we're into the holiday season, which is incredible. Um, but yeah, we expect to see some price pressure on the on uranium going forward for the year. So we're watching very closely to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I should look at some notes in the background here uh, to share a couple of more elements from this conference because I think it's it's pretty high level, but. Um, I would say the most impactful things, takeaways from this had to do with the discussion about inventories um, from with from Jonathan Hinsey from UXC, which was a, a very interesting discussion. We've seen inventories drawn down in the US and in the EU. Um, China soaked up an incredible amount of uranium from the early 2000s uh, till uh, just a couple of years ago, as far as their calculations go. They did almost 800 million pounds worth of purchasing in the last 20 years. Um, and they've consumed about 300 million pounds during that same time frame. So they've got a chunky inventory, but 
what we've seen is they're holding on to that inventory more tightly. And there's plenty of evidence of that this year. We've seen the Chinese go from marginal sellers to actual buyers, even in the spot market. And we've seen these huge contracts with Kazakhstan. So just the kind of the pounding the table by folks who their entire career is studying the uranium market in these certain areas of this world, of the world, right? And they're pounding the table saying, don't expect more supply out of Kazakhstan to go to the West. It's going to go in the opposite direction. And that trend has only started. So that was that was one of the big takeaways. And then I would say um, the other big takeaway was for me was just trying to really recognize near to midterm supply. Is there anything I'm missing? Um, my takeaway from that is no, there's nothing that I'm missing in terms of near and midterm supply. Uh, it remains very, very tight. And I was not able to find any reasons to not be um, as bullish as I was before the conference, if not more now, based on recognizing this fact. I don't see where that supply valve is. And I couldn't get a good answer to that question from anyone in the industry. Hmm. The good question that I'm looking for an answer, though, is who's taking care of your trees while you're away? <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, it cooled down here. So uh, not a whole lot of maintenance necessary. But no, uh, my wife watered the garden while I was gone and it's uh, it's rocking. So, yeah. So you got to do a bunch of chores this weekend to to pay her back. I do. I do. Yeah. The, the honeydew list grew uh, just from being away for four days. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot for sitting down with me, Justin. My pleasure. Always good to see you.